give you the title because I don't know if I'm going to get there or not. Amen. 2 Samuel chapter number 5. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the good grace of God. And Lord, I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to stand here. And God, by the help of God, rightly divide the word of truth. And we certainly do pray right now, God, that you'd help us to do that. God, rightly divide the word of truth. I pray, Father, the Spirit of God would move and have his place in our hearts and our lives today. And God, I pray that you'd stir us for thy glory. Again, bless the preaching of the word of God. Let me say nothing contrary to thy will, but all we say will be to thy glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Second Samuel chapter number 5. I'll begin reading with verse number 1. David is about to become king over Israel. And uh, he will be about 30 years old when he becomes king over Israel. Now he uh, slew the Goliath sometime probably when he's 17, 18 years old. He was a teenager when he slew Goliath. And then we know that after, after that, we, you know, there's not a whole lot we know about him, but, it, but when he becomes 30 years old, we have the stories of him, and 30 years old, he becomes king of Israel. Now, he has ran from Saul. We know that he's hidden in caves, and we know these stories. But God makes him king over Israel at 30 years old. What time did Christ begin his earthly ministry? About 30 years old. So we see that uh, David is a type of Christ. Now, in verse number 1, Then came all the tribes of Israel to David and to Hebron, <coughs> and spake, saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. Also in time past, when Saul was king over us, thou wast he that led us out and brought us in Israel. And the Lord said to thee, Thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be a captain over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king of Hebron, and King David was made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. So David was anointed to be their king. Now he wasn't called, he wasn't crowned, but he was anointed to be their king. Now, of course, God called him, but they anointed him. There's something in an anointing that takes precedence over someone being simply crowned as king. He was anointed, the people wanted him, and God had put his approval upon David being the king of Israel. So David being 30 years old and, and already had been a man of war and already had had a lot of experience in leadership, he became the king of Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over, Ju over Judah seven years and six months, and in, all, and in Jerusalem, he reigned 30 and three years over all Israel and Judah. Now, David is going to, is going to take the city of Jerusalem uh, for his kingdom. And they don't occupy that as of then, right at that present time. But God's going to deliver it into their hands. The nation of Israel has always had enemies. They always will have enemies. They've got more enemies today than probably they've ever had. It uh, seems like every nation in the world is turning its back on Israel, including us. But God's always got his hand on them, and God will always provide for them, and God will always protect his chosen people. So uh, in verse number 6, And the king and his men went to Jerusalem to the Jebusites, who were the inhabitants of Jerusalem, in the inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in hither, thinking David cannot come in hither. Now David was going to take that town, he was going to take that city. But they, in, in their uh, belief in false gods, in their belief in, in, uh, you know, in, in their idolatrous relationships with other gods, they had sat upon the walls. Now, this is my take on it. There's others that say other things, but this you do what this with what you want to. But they had sat upon their walls, as was many that had uh, beliefs that were not of God, many idolater, idolaters, worshippers. They had set idols along the top of their walls, believing that that would protect them from the enemy. Now, others say that that was 
uh, really people that were dumb and blind that they put up there in mockery as that no one could, could penetrate uh, that city and get into them. But there was, a, there was a weak point in the city. And so they said, if you, unless you can get rid of the, the dumb and the, and the lame, uh, you can't enter the city because they did not think that David could get the city uh, infiltrated where he could get in and live in the city. So nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, the same as the city of David. So he took it. They said he couldn't, but he did. And so here is a, a scenario of what happened. And David said on that day, the day that he took the city, he said on that day, whosoever getteth up to the gutter, What's the gutter? Now it is told, and you know my studies have have shown that possibly this was a underground tunnel that was used to take water into the city when the city was besieged. They would use that gut called a gutter. They would take that and use it, and it wasn't real big. Uh, they could uh, go through that gutter and have water in there. And so he said, "Whosoever getteth up to the gutter." and smiteth the Jebusites, and the lame and the blind, that are hated by David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. Wherefore they said, The blind and the lame shall not come into the house. So Jabel, uh, I believe it was over in the book of uh, Chronicles, it says that he uh, went in through that gutter and got in there and destroyed, uh, you know, was able to get in there and destroy the lame and on the top of the roof and, and the Jebusites, and allowed David into the city. So now David is king, and he's in the city of David. He's in, he set up his throne in the city of David. So David dwelled in the fort and called it the city of David, and David built around about from Milo and inward. And David went on and grew great, and the Lord God of hosts was with him. David is growing. David is leading the kingdom, and God is with David. Now you look over David's life, and David had a, had a life that was uh, sometimes a very uh, you know scandalous life. He did some things that's very unscrupulous, and he did some things that you wonder how God could ever use him. Well, let me tell you something today, friend. We've all been in places, and we wonder how could God use us. And and God can use those that will give their hearts and lives to them, even though they fail, even though people are failures, God can still use them for His glory. It is proven by the life of David how that God continued to use David. So the kingdom began to grow, and Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David, and cedar trees, and carpenters, and masons, and they, and they built David a house. And David perceived that the Lord had established him king over Israel and that he had exalted his kingdom for his people, Israel's sake. So things are going well for David. Things are going well in the kingdom. Now David does some things in these next few verses that shouldn't have done, but he did them. But God continued to bless. And David took him more concubines and wives out of Jerusalem after he was yet from Hebron, and there were yet sons and daughters born to David. And these be the names of those that were born unto him in Jerusalem, Shammah and Shobab and Nathan and Solomon, Ibhar also in Elishu and Nepheg and Japhi and Elias Amam, Elida and Eliphalet. But when the Philistine heard that they had anointed David king, or when the Philistines heard, they had anointed David king over Israel. All the Philistines came up to seek David, and David heard of it and went down to the hole. So the Philistines, once again, he's always seemingly battling the Philistines. And I, I doubt that they ever forgave him for slaying their giant Goliath. And so they... Uh, always against David, and David's always dealing with the Philistines, so David goes down into the hole. He goes down there to, uh, you know, protect him while he figures out what God wants him to do. Now, David's a man after God's own heart. Always remember that. David's a man of prayer. David's a man of faith. And, and as we take our example out of da uh, from David, we all be one that's after God's own heart. We ought to be one that seeks God. We ought to be one that, that 
uh, embraces that God will help us if we'll call on Him, if we'll ask Him, if we'll believe Him, if we'll trust Him. We can call on God and God will deliver us. So David, and I'm going to get to where I was going. I, D- David is going to inquire of God what he should do. Now, friend, I'll tell you something. When something comes in your life, uh, when a battle's brewing in your life, and when uh, difficulties arise in your life, the best thing you can do is to go to God and inquire of Him what you should do. Now, we know that we are to lean on God. We know that we're to trust in God. But sometimes in the battle, we don't understand exactly how to fight it. We've been there and done that, and so are you. But we do what we do in the strength and the power of God. And that's what David's wanting. He's going to do the strength, do what he does in the strength and in the power of God. The Philistines also came and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to the Philistines? Will thou deliver them into mine hand? And the Lord said unto David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into thine hand. So the Philistines have, surround, <coughs> have surrounded the city. And they've come against it. They're surrounding and, and maybe waiting to attack, maybe waiting for the right moment. And their numbers are great. And, and uh, David goes to the Lord and says, Lord, what do you want me to do? Will you give them into my hand? If I go to battle, are, the, are we going to win? I'll tell you something, friend. When you go to, the ba- go to the battle in the name of the Lord, you're going to win. Amen? Now, we lose. We, we're, listen, we're going to win this battle. We're going to win this battle because our, our place after we leave this world is heaven. And, friend, that's the winner. Amen? Now, we may lose a battle down here once in a while. We may fight a battle and lose a round once in a while, but we're not going to lose the major battle. Amen. We're going to, we're going to, we are going to be victors, which we already are, through and by and in Christ Jesus. Amen. So the devil's fighting. He's fighting you. He's fighting me. He tries to discourage us every way that he can. He tries to keep us from prayer. He tries to keep us from the Word of God. He tries to keep us from the house of God. But I want to tell you, if you'll be faithful to God, God will be faithful to you. Amen? So he inquires of the Lord, and the Lord says, Yeah, I'm going to give them into your hand. Now the strategy here is different from probably what David's been used to fighting. When David go out to battle, man, he'd go with his, his band of men, and, and God give them power, and they clean out. But here's what God says to do. <clears throat> and David came to Baal Perism. And David smote them there and said, The Lord hath broken forth upon mine enemies before me as the breach of waters. Therefore he called the name of that place Belperizim. And there they left their images, and David and his men burned them. So he went in, he conquered them, and burned their images because David did not like the idolatrous worship of the Philistines. And the Philistines came yet again. And spread themselves in the valley of Rephim. So he beat them and they come back. Now this strategy that God is about to use with David has very important significance in it for you and I. The battle we fight is not always the battle that we think or, or the way that we think we ought to be fighting it. And Sometimes silence is the best way to fight a battle. Amen? If it's a battle of words that someone's trying to have with you, it takes two to battle with work. Sometimes silence is the best way to battle. Then sometimes being outspoken is a way to battle with the devil. But you've got to let God show you what's right and show you the way. Now David was used to heading, going headlong into the battle, but God has a different plan for David in this battle. The, the Philistines are gathered round about in the valley of Ephraim again. And so here's what God says. And th- when David inquired of the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to do now? How do you want me to do this? God, what do you want me to do? See, David was always inquiring of the Lord what to do. Do you always inquire of the Lord as what he wants you to do in your life? We should. 
We should be those that inquire of the Lord and say, Lord, what will thou have me to do? God, what do you want me to do? And if I ask you this morning how many of you are facing some kind of battle, probably everybody raise your hand because this is not a life of ease. This Christian life is not a bed of roses. It's not a life of ease. But it is a life of battle after battle. We fight, we fight. But don't give up. Never, never, never give up the fight. Stay with God. Stay in the battle no matter what happens. Stay by the stuff and stay in the battle. So we find that as he's up against the Philistines again, he goes before the Lord and the Lord says to do this. Thou shalt not go up, but fetch a compass behind them and come upon them over against the mulberry trees. So David and his men snuck out. Compass means to compass, to come around. And they compassed the enemy, got around them, and got on the back side of the enemy in the mulberry trees. Now there's lots of discussion what kind of trees these were. I'll tell you, they're mulberry trees. If it's the same kind of mulberry tree that we've got, I don't know, but they were mulberry trees. Now, seems kind of odd that God would do this, doesn't it? But see, we're not fighting the battle. God's fighting the battle. Sometimes He fights battles for us in ways we don't understand. But God's doing it, amen? God's doing it. So David, in obedience, he could have said, No, I don't want to do it that way. I'm going headlong. And he'd have got slaughtered. But the enemy... I believe saw what David was doing, but they didn't know what to do. Probably made them nervous. I never like anybody behind me. I just and I turned that chair around a while ago because I trust y'all. I don't know what kind of phobia you call that. I'll look it up because there's probably one for it. But if I'm in a crowd, I I don't like that. I just you know I'd rather back up against the wall or something and. Going to a restaurant, sit down. You can ask my wife. I don't like to sit with my back to the crowd. If I'm sitting with my back, I go over in the corner and sit with my back. That's just the way I am. And I'm not the only one because there's many of you the same way. But evidently, this made the Philistines, it had to make them nervous because they wondered what was going on back there behind them. Whether they knew the whole army of David was back there or whether they knew maybe a company of men had went back there. But I believe they were discomfited because they knew that the enemy had gotten behind them. So that threw all their tactics off. They didn't know what to do. I'm reading between the lines, but it seems to be right. So here's what God said to do. Now they're in the mulberry trees. Get that. Are you picturing that in your mind, the big valley? And down here's a stand of mulberry trees, and David's men are down there behind the mulberry trees, hidden in the mulberry trees. Use your imagination. You got that in your mind? You got to have this in your mind or this ain't going to work. You got that in your mind? Now you use apple trees, poplar trees, pine trees. I don't care what you use. But you get them back there in a thicket with the, with the mulberry trees around them. Because here's what God says he's going to do. And let it be when thou hearest and here's the title of my message, The Sound of a Going. The Sound of a Going. So when you hear the sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees, and then thou shalt bestir thyself, for then shall the Lord go out before thee to smite the host of the Philistines, and David did so as the Lord had commanded him and smote the Philistines from Geba until thou come to Gezer. So we see here David's obedience to do what God said to do and we see the complete victory that God gave David because he was in obedience to do whatever God said to do. Now maybe David was scratching his head. <clears throat> Maybe David was scratching his head saying, "What, are, God, what are you doing? Have you ever wondered what God's doing in your life? 
Have you ever wondered why God's doing what he's doing in your life? But if you do, just don't question God. Just let God work because God knows what he's doing in your life. Amen? So David waited. David was patient. And God gave the victory. Now, the going, the going, the sound of a going. What is that? What is the sound of a going? And I was reading in my devotions. That's where I came the other morning. I was reading and I came across this verse. And the big old bold letters. And I look at my Bible now. It's not like that. But it was when I read it. The sound of a going. Now, we live in the mountains. We live around the trees. And in the fall, when the leaves are dried on the trees, we can hear the leaves rustling in the wind. Is that right? But it sounds like a gentle rustling of leaves, doesn't it? It doesn't sound like anything in particular. This had to be something that was recognizable to David as being unusual. Now, could it have been the wind? I'm going to use that and say that it could have been the wind. It might not have been, but I'm going to use that. But not a gentle rustling of the wind. The Bible says the sound of a going. And I'm going to believe, amen, and I'm going to preach it like this, that there was a, a tumultuous wind that come along through those mulberry trees. And I believe that was the sign to David when those, the sound of a going, it sounded like something going on. Many scholars have said that I've read after, said that it must have sounded like the host of the heavenly angels of God coming to help David fight the battle. Amen? As they came rustling through the leaves and the power of God moved up over those mulberry trees and the, and the clatter and the, the noise, the sound of a going that went through those trees. No doubt David knew what to do because he said he bestirred himself. In other words, when that sound came, David didn't wonder what it was. David got up and he attacked, led by the host, I believe, of God's army. Amen. Now, that must have discomfited the armies of the Philistines. Can you imagine? All is calm around them and there's not any wind going. Maybe the gentle breeze, but down over those mulberry trees comes a, comes a huge hard wind and they're listening and saying, what's going on? In the mulberry trees, it sounds like an army, a great army coming against us. Maybe that discomfited them and they decided, what are we up against? But we know one thing, God gave them the victory. Amen. God gave David the victory. Now I want to use that thought, the sound of going, and give you these three things about the wind. The sound of the wind, the sound of a going of the wind, what it signifies in your life and in my life. Now, we're not under the circumstances that David was in where we're fighting a literal ba battle. We may be someday. But what, but what we do every day is we fight a battle with the devil and with the forces of hell, and I'm not able to do it except by the power of a, of a thrice holy God. Except it's God's army that fights the battle for me, I will always lose. But with God, nothing shall be impossible. And with God, I can do all things through Christ which strengthen me. Amen. Some of you looking at me like, preacher, have you lost your mind? I don't understand the thing you're saying. Get with me. Hey, God in heaven will fight your battles. Amen. If you don't get anything else today, remember, God will fight the battle for you, and you'll always win. Amen. So we see here, I believe, that when David heard the wind, I believe David was encouraged. God's doing what he said he was doing. Let's go. When, he, when the enemy heard the wind, I believe that they were terrified. And as the armies of the Lord marched, I believe, through those mulberry trees, God was saying, I'm fighting it, you're going to win. Now, the wind, the sound of a going of the wind in our lives, the wind signifies the presence of the Lord. I like it when God shows himself in the sound of a going. Amen. Maybe nobody else can hear it but me, but God 
lets me know that God's working and God's moving and God's winning the battle and fighting the battle for me. Listen, my friend, is God where you're at? Where is He where you're at? Is He is He in your life? Are you following Him? Is He leading you and are you following? If not, my friend, you're in a you're in a battle that you fight on your own. God must be present with you in the battle. And we know that God signifies his presence uh, by the wind. 2 Samuel 22, 11, And he rode upon a cherub and did fly, and he was seen upon the wings of the wind. That's where God is, friend. God is on the wings of the wind. Here in Scripture, Psalms 103, 104 and verse 3, Who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters, who maketh the clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind. Oh, my friend today, don't ever think that you can get into a battle that God can't help you with. If you're in the will of God and you're striving to do the will of God, when you get in a battle, amen, God knows you're there and He's there. Amen, listen for Him. Listen for Him on the wings of the wind. Have your ear open where you can hear the Lord speak to you and God help you, and God give you direction in your life. God sounds in the, in the uh, wings of the wind. On the Sea of Galilee, what did God do? He showed himself in the wind. You remember this? When Jesus came to the men on the Sea of Galilee, and they were frightened, and they were terrified. Two different instances. One, Jesus was asleep in the boat. And the other time he came walking to them on the sea with the wind tumultuous and with the wind blowing around them. God came to them in the wind and God said, Peace. Jesus said, Peace be still. And the wind laid down. Friend, that's God. The storms may come in your life and you may experience the winds of, of destruction, the winds of peril. But remember, God's in the wind. Amen. God controls the wind. He controls the battle. He controls the heartache. God's presence is seen in the wind. And then number two, the wind shows the power of God. The wind shows the power of God. Now, it doesn't take but somebody with a preacher ready to say one eye and half cent to see that when a hurricane comes along that it is going to cause catastrophe and disaster. And we see that. That is something that we can see with the eye. When we see that, we know that that was made by God. God allowed that storm to come. He allowed that hurricane to come. And God allows it to destroy when it destroys. all. Because, you, why? That's up to God. That's His business. Now, we've seen some hurricane force winds come through these mountains, and it makes a mess. There's a place over in, over in uh, wherever I was at, uh, somewhere up above Canton Sunburn. And I went there hunting, and I had to cross the creek with with uh, waders on and get across the creek, take them off and hide them so nobody would steal them, and go hunting. Now that's dedication, isn't it? And why that water's cold in the middle of the winter. You fall in, you're in a mess. So I'd wade across through there, and I'd been there several times. Well, a hurricane came through there. And I went back to go hunting, and I got my waders on. I went through the creek, hid my waders, and I started to where I was going to hunt, and I could not hardly pass through because of what the storm had done in those woods. I mean, trees, huge trees, falling like this everywhere, just all over that valley up through there. And I finally made it, but it was very difficult. Why? Because the storm had come through there. Storms will usually cause disaster and cause damage. But remember, friend, God's in the storm. And so we know that the wind shows the power of God when the Lord came <coughs> to David in the wind, it showed the power of God and what God could do. The sound of a going to David was the sound of a rushing wind, was the sound of victory 
in David's ears. Waiting for the sound of the going. When the winds of adversity, when they blow in their lives. Listen, you're, I'm telling you something, friend. Listen to me. You're either in a battle right now, or you just came out of a battle right now, or you're going into a battle pretty soon. You're going to need this message. And what can I say to you to encourage you is listen for the sound of a going of the power of God. Listen for God's voice. Listen for God's direction because God will give you direction and God will see you through. We see that the wind shows the power of God. God used the wind to dry out the floods of water. After the flood, God used the wind to dry out the land. When the children of Israel passed through the Sea of Galilee, how did God, what did God use to create dry land for the Israelites to pass over? He used the wind. I tell you, friend, the sound. If they had the knowledge and knew what was going to be, they could also say the sound of a going as God used that wind to dry up the Red Sea as they passed through. God used the wind when the children of Israel, when they came into the, uh, in, into the, the desert, into the wilderness, and they wanted to be fed and they wanted meat. What did God use to feed them? He used the wind. He brought in the quail on the wind. Feed the children of Israel because they wanted meat. In 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 11, we see how that God used the, the wind to teach Elijah. And then in Matthew 14, 22, we find that Jesus used the wind to teach Matthew uh, or uh, teach Peter about his faith. So we see the sound of a going proves to us that God is working and God is moving. Now I want you, when you leave here, every time you hear the leaves rustle, I want you to think of God, the sound of a going. I want you to think of the power of God and how God will work and how God can work if we'll listen to Him and if we'll let Him help us and direct us. You know what's the matter with most people's life? They live in, in defeat all the time. They won't listen to the Lord. They want to fight their own battles. They don't want to listen to God. They want to, you know, they want to uh, uh, do it their own self. And guess what happens? They always wind up in defeat. I'm almost through. Number three. The winds strengthen the people of God. And David, as he heard the sound of a going, he was to bestir himself and get up and go fight. Now, friend, if you're in a battle and God tells you to do something, God gives you some direction, you better, listen, first of all, you better be close enough to God to hear His direction. That's what's the matter with most people today. We ain't close enough to God to hear His direction, so we wind up in a mess. But we need to be close enough to hear the direction of God. And when God says to do something, we ought to get up and take some action. Amen? We ought to be very decisive in our in our battle against the forces of hell by the power of God to get up and take some action and do what God says for us to do. Have on the whole armor of God and go out to battle like God says to battle. Listen, we're, not, we're living in a day when God needs soldiers. We're living in a day when God needs strong people to fight and to stand for Him. This is not a day for cowards. This is not a day for, for uh, people with weak knees. Amen. We need the power of God on our lives. And we need the power of God in our churches. And we need the power of God in our nation. But I'll tell you something, it starts with me and it starts with you. Having the power of God in my life. Amen. And God will only work with His power and use His power when we allow Him and give Him free reign of our lives and in our heart. So instead of us living in the fear of the winds of adversity, of affliction, we need to understand God's working something in our lives. And friend, when God works something in our lives, it's all for His glory. We're here for a little while. We're here for a little season and then we're gone. 
My life's over half over. I don't know how long I'm going to live. Hopefully it's 100. I'd swap my goal this year for 100 plus. But if this world keeps going the way it's going, friends, that many years from now, many years from now, amen, this world's going to be in a terrible, disastrous mess except God come or except revival take over, except God straighten it out. We're headed for a mess. But it's going to take God to see us through these times of adversity. You better armor up. You better get ready. You better prepare for the coming battle that's coming upon Christianity. Amen. I'm telling you, it's no time to be a weak-kneed Christian. But it is time to show some boldness about your faith and show some boldness about You say, oh, preacher, I've heard this all my life. Nothing's ever changed. Nothing's ever going to change. Let me tell you something. You've heard it all your life, and it's been coming on all your life. It's been getting worse all of your life. Look, anybody again with one eye and half sense cannot help but see that this world can't stand in the shape it's in much longer. I'm listening for the sound of a going. I'm listening for the sound of a going. Number one, and I'm about finished. This is not, an, this is not another message or another outline. I'm listening to the sound of a going, number one, for revival in Gabriel's Creek Baptist Church. I've been praying, God, will you send us a revival? Will you send us a stir? God, will you get us out of our last day, days of cold attitudes and get us off of our leaves? And God, will you begin to stir in our pews and in our hearts? And God, will you stir this preacher and make him fit to stand and preach the word of God? God, will you use me? God, will you send revival that we might get stirred for the glory of God? I long to see it. I long to see it. I long to see a revival where, listen, revival is for God's people to get, to get on fire for the Lord. And I long to see it. You say, preacher, we're doing pretty good. I agree with you. We're doing pretty good. But amen, the more we, better we do, the more I want. Amen. I'm listening for the sound of a going of revival. Then, then last thing, I'm listening for the sound of a going, for that trump of God to sound. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. And those which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. I'm listening for the sound of a going of the trumpet of God. And I'll tell you something, friends. When, when, when I get to heaven, I don't want to just barely make it in. You ask my mom, you ask my wife, I don't like for just any, just barely to get anything done except paint the bathroom. I've been working on that about three months, but I'll finally get it accomplished. More goes along with that. But listen, I don't like anything halfway done. I don't want to live halfway for the Lord. I don't want to give God part of my time I want God to have all of my time I get disgusted because there's things that I want to do that I don't have time to do because I have other things that I have to do but I want God to have all the time that I've got in whatever time that it is I want him to use me for his glory how dedicated are you to the Lord everybody bow your head just a minute we're going to close right here and I want you to do some serious heart searching, soul searching right now. If none of this applies to you, then amen. Praise the Lord. But I'm going to tell you, it applies to me. How many of you here sitting here this morning, don't raise your hand. I just want you to ask yourself this question. In the still of the hour, in the still of the moment, am I doing all I can for God? Am I doing all I can for the Lord? Am I giving Him all my time? Have I given Him my whole heart? Have I given Him my whole life? Is there something I'm holding back that God can use of me? Am I dedicated to the Lord? Father, I pray right now, God, in the stillness of this hour, God, as you speak to our hearts, Father, I pray that we dedicate our hearts and our lives to Thee. God, I pray that we give ourselves over to Thee. God, that we become more faithful to You. God, we become more faithful to the house of God. 
Lord, as we listen for the sound of a going, the Almighty God, Lord, as we listen for that sound of a going of revival, God, it's got to start. Lord, with the folks that are here today, God, I'm not satisfied with the same old, same old. God, I'm not satisfied with... Lord, keep going the way, Father, that everything's always gone. God, we need more power. God, we need more of thy, thy strength. God, we need revival. God, would you please bless us and help us. God, touch every heart that's here. Lord, as we answer that question, God, have you got my whole life? Am I dedicated to you? Have I surrendered all to you? God, help us, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. While every head's bowed, no one looking around.